is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 353. Thank you for being a little patient there at the beginning. We were working out some technical stuff. Uh, all my fault, of course. Uh, we have a big show tonight. Our guest, I, I use the term badass all the time, but I think our guest tonight defines the word. So anytime I use it, it's more in relation to our guest mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, Mag fair. Maggie Guterrell is going to join us on the show tonight, and I can't wait to talk to her about her winning of the Cocodona 250, 250 mile race from, uh, uh, I wanted to say Black Canyon City, but it's, uh, oh my God, I just wrote this out. It, it's from <laughs> one city in Arizona to another city, Flagstaff, 250 miles away. It's Black Canyon City to Flagstaff. Oh, it is Black Canyon City. Yeah. I mean, that's what you wrote. Is that what I wrote? Then that is correct. <laughs> wow. I'm so excited about tonight's show. As you can tell, I'm also probably a little nervous because our our, mm. our guest is just, it's always a joy to have her on the show. She's been on the show a handful of times. It's been a while now, long overdue. So uh, our guest tonight, Maggie Gutero, will be joining us. I'm so excited. Episode 353 of Ginger Runner Live begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! What is up, everyone? <laughs> Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 353. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. And we're moving the time tonight. Uh, this was to accommodate Maggie, our guest tonight. But at the same time, it's kind of our favorite time to do this show. But also, listen, if Maggie wants to do the show at midnight, we do the show at midnight. We do midnight. the show at midnight. We're, we're, we <laughs> do what Maggie needs because having our guest tonight, Maggie Guterrell, on the show is a privilege. It is an honor. Uh, we'll introduce her in just a second here. Uh, but yeah, I kind of like the 5 p.m. Pacific time slot. It, it We've been doing an earlier 4 p.m. Started Ginger Runner Live, the first 200 plus episodes at around 6 p.m. Maybe this is a happy medium. Maybe we should get used to this. Mm -hmm. I like it. Uh, welcome to the show tonight, everybody. We're very excited to introduce our guest here in just a second. But of course, it's not just myself. It's not just our guest. We have Kim. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I just want to say hello. If you're new in the chat room, uh, say hi to everybody. Hi. I feel like I've been seeing some new names in there. If you're a new welcome, we'll be bringing Maggie on in just a second. And because we are live, you can ask questions. So put your questions in the chat room. Already a ton of questions. Yeah. So if your question isn't being asked, just pop it in there again. We we'll are, do our best. We'll do our best to get to the live questions. We also have a Discord server, and we have a, a number of questions from our Discord server that we can ask tonight. Our Discord uh, is for our GR crew, and that's kind of, I want to transition into this brief uh, mention that we do at the top of every show, thanking our GR crew. It is our Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash the ginger runner. It is because of them that we're able to do these live shows every single week. We do also daily live shows called Daily Brew. We talk about running, training, uh, injuries, food, pets, everything. Uh, we do that with the GR crew. We also uh, have like a book club, uh, Mario Kart nights, trivia nights. It, it's insane how much we have going on. A lot of stuff going all on all week over there. long in our GR crew. So if you'd like to join the GR crew, it's very easy to do. Head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. And we have two individuals in particular at that top, top tier that we like to mention at the top of every Ginger Runner Live episode, Rick Bjarnason at a BC Canada. He's an ultra runner. He also is a web designer and a web maintenance. Uh, his company, CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca, uh, they did the gingerrunner.com website. They maintain that website. They're awesome. Rick is awesome. Also, Brian Sands. Brian Sands, truly inspiring athlete, has been uh, in the ultra running game now for, for a long time. Um, his fitness journey lost over 100 pounds, uh, ran his first 50K a few years back, then just has gradually increased his mileage. He did a DIY 100 miler last year. Just Doesn't truly Doesn't get inspired. any more legit than that. Yeah. And he was going to run Cocodona 250, but yes. he's, he's pushed up, I believe, until next year. It, it, he's going to be an exciting runner to, to follow. We're really, really thankful to have Brian on the crew. Now, without further ado, our guest tonight is coming to us all the way from Somewhere in Colorado, somewhere at altitude. I'm assuming she's back home out of Arizona, but just won the Cocodona 250, 250 mile race that takes you from Black Canyon City. I just looked that up. Black Canyon City to Flagstaff, <laughs> Arizona, through the rugged mountains, insane heat. And most of it was broadcast live this year. We're going to talk about that as well and what that was like for Maggie at the front pack. But uh, without further ado, it's been a while. Welcome her back to the show. Maggie Guterrell. Maggie. 
Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are First you? First of all, the technical difficulties were all my fault, so <laughs> not yours. <laughs> I'll, I'll always take the blame. I will never uh, put the blame on my guests <laughs> because I I should have started earlier. You and I should like I should have tested it earlier. So I'll take the blame. But I did put you through a rigmarole of like having to log in and change your password and. Thank you, Maggie, for being patient with me. Yeah, it's good to be back on your. I feel like I haven't seen you guys, like literally seen you guys in forever. Um, yeah, in person? When? God, maybe states or something? Like, I don't yeah. know when the last time we actually saw you in person. It's been too long. Yeah. 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 Because you weren't at Barkley when I was over there. No. Nope. No, I think it was. Yeah, I think you went the year after uh, that I was filming, Gary. 17. Yeah. 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 Yep. So obviously a lot of life has taken place in the last year. Um, uh, it seems like, well, it seems like a lot has been put on <laughs> hold, but a lot of world things have happened in the last year. And I, I do, of course, want to start there. Before we start diving into Cocodona and just in regards to the last year of training and, and things that you've been up to, you, uh, I... Your dog just had surgery today, so if you have to go take care of the dog, of course, please do that. It sounds like your dog had the same surgery that our dog did, actually. Everything okay? Well, yeah, no, I mean, everything's fine. Um, all his, like, lumps were benign and stuff, but he had a tooth removed, and they took out, like, another little lump in his mouth, and he had a big old lump on his leg. He's just lumpy. Um, <laughs> really drugged up right now, and Ryan's downstairs with him, but he is, like not understanding that he can't really move around he's got a big old bandage and so he's like jumping on the couch and just being dumb <laughs> okay yeah because i mean the same thing happened with our dog gus you know lumps lumpy and yeah yeah so just you know obviously hoping he's all well and if you do need to go to take care of the drugged out dog please don't hesitate well, to bounce. talking about gus earlier because like ryan was saying like is it a possibility to do like 3d printed like things for dogs you know like 3d printed jaws or something and i was like oh i don't know and that sounds really expensive <laughs> yeah i think i feel like there is prosthetics for them but mm -hmm. i think it's like extremely expensive and dogs yeah. are just you know dogs are dogs and they don't really i don't know they bounce back They're, really really fast They're like eh. yeah yeah and yeah, he's like cuter than and I don't think they notice certain things like they, you know, they take a leg off and they don't notice. They just hop around on three legs. <laughs> it's funny how quickly Gus took to not having a jaw. Where is he? Of course, he's, he's laying out. here. Yeah, we leave sleeping. his bed right here so people can so he can just walk into shot and stuff. But it's amazing how quickly he adapted yeah. to not having a jaw. He eats crazy amounts of food like a champ doesn't even, you know, he's got a couple back molars. That's how he does it. But. I would think like a prosthetic jaw. He'd just be like, get this thing off. <laughs> I'm good. Like I've got a couple molars. I'm good to go. I want to talk a little bit about the the last year because obviously races have been canceled, but, you know, adventures haven't been canceled. And it seems like where you live is a, a perfect destination to be able to get out your back door, to be able to head up into the mountains and to be able to get big miles, big days training whether or not you know you're training for anything. So for the last year, have you focused on building mileage or has it been maintenance or did you take time off? Because, uh, you know, obviously a lot happened and maybe Colorado had specific re restrictions and stuff like that. What's your last year been like before we even get into Cocodona stuff? Um, I got my first major real injury last year after that, um, you know, the ultra running meme that I got a real injury in a fake race. That was me like <laughs> 15 backyard thing. And, um, I did like 40 ish miles and I was in so much pain and I just thought like, I don't know, whatever. And, uh, a couple of days later I still could barely walk and everything was shut down. So I couldn't really like, and I couldn't pinpoint the pain. And finally the uh, Meredith Edwards said, that sounds like SI joint pain. Um, and that's what it was. So I got, I finally got to a PT and a chiropractor helped and dry needling and just, I still do the PT stuff, but yeah, for two months from, uh, all of April and May, I really didn't run at all. Wow. Um, yeah. And then the summer was great though. Cause like, I just started kind of hiking and doing like big mountain stuff once the snow melted. 
um, had a couple of wake up calls. I went to run with Courtney and do some mountain stuff with her and thought I was just really out of shape. Cause like, I mean, in comparison, it's just, just, it's really hard to keep up. And then figured out that I had this asthma issue from some like either virus or bronchitis from early December. Um, and so that was like a whole thing. So I didn't really have any like focused training last year. I just kind of was like trying to survive. Um, but I did spend like long days in the mountains on the weekends, just going slow with like Megan Hicks and Courtney or whoever, you know, go with me and stuff. Um, and wanted to go slow enough for me. <laughs> I just like that. I was just trying to survive. I feel like that was like all of us last year. Basically. <laughs> yeah. You take it. Because like, Ahead, I didn't really have major restrictions. You were, I think there's some rule. You were technically not supposed to go to trails that were more than six miles from your house, but like, that's like all of Durango. So, um, and once things melt, like who cares? There's so much space out there. You just go and you don't see anyone. So, um, I was pretty lucky to be stuck here instead of somewhere super populated. Yeah. Yeah. Being somewhere super populated was certainly tough. Uh, there was a period of time where we couldn't even touch dirt, you know, because one, we didn't live anywhere close to a trailhead. And uh, there was a lot of restrictions here in Washington State, specifically in regards to travel and, and how far you could go and stuff. And that's that's interesting. I, I, I hadn't realized that you were injured for the beginning portion of that year, plus asthma and, and everything like that. Did that take an emotional toll on because so much happened so quickly in the world? What did that feel like emotionally for you to have everything that's sort of going on outside of Durango, but then also things that are going on internally? Was it a heavy weight? Did you see light at the end of the tunnel? What was it like for you? Uh, I think it was more once I was running again, it felt frustrating to get back. So I think more the asthma thing was annoying. Um, so, uh, yeah, like then finally, I think August and September, I could kind of train again and focus on, um, on, on bigs and, and hoping that like my body would hold together for that. Um, so it was good to look forward to a race and, and like have something to kind of train for, but I didn't do anything really specific. I was just like, get healthy and then go run, you know, cause like it's hard to say how to train for that. Like you don't have to be super fast. You just have to be really durable. Um, and of course it's never like the thing you think it's going to be like, at bigs, like I had this like weird knee swelling thing that was, um, oh, it sounded like a baker's cyst after I like talked to people and read about it, you know, use the old internet for diagnosis. And <laughs> I finally went to the doctor and they did MRI and they said either it burst and it's gone, but there's really no evidence of it. So who knows? But yeah, my knee swelled up in the back of it during big. So it wasn't even my SI joint. It wasn't even that same leg or side. So you never know, but it was good to go back and see people and like race and stuff. That was like right before it got like, you know, crazy again over the winter. Right. Yeah. That October. Yeah, it was it was interesting to follow along with that, too, and seeing and following people racing again. It's just it was such a weird stage and I'm watching and following a race take place like it feels like this hasn't happened in forever. And here we are following it again. And then, yeah, it's sort of like took steps back and stuff like that. Uh, again, we are live with Maggie Guterrell. If you have any questions for her in regards to Coco Dunna, we're going to get into that conversation here real quick. Mm -hmm. Kim, you've already, I didn't realize how many questions there already are uh, from both <clears throat> Discord and live. So let's get to some of those. We can dig in. A lot of these are Cocodona based questions, okay. um, but Ange asks a great question. They ask, I'm wondering what advice Maggie would give to someone interested in a 200 plus distance who has experiences with hundreds. What's the difference and what are the new challenges? Uh, I would say the main challenge is sleep. Like, cause I think if you got your nutrition down for a hundred, you can, you know, I, People say you have, you know, food over multiple days, but I feel like I've proved that you actually don't have to because I couldn't. But, um, yeah, I think the sleep's the main thing. So, and that's like a big experiment. And I don't know, people go into it. I asked in the Cogadona Runners group, um, like, what people did for sleep because I wrote, like, a report for Tailwind on the blog, but I was just curious, like, how people approach it because I still don't really know if I've 
at, you can't ever figure it out. I feel like, cause every race it's different, but, um, some people treat it more like a stage race and like, they have five days to complete it. So they're going to sleep four hours a night or 90 minutes or, or whatever and get there in five days. Cause it's totally doable. If you just keep moving forward at a good pace, you know, and, um, and so that's a cool way to approach it. If like, you're not trying to like be at the front of the pack or anything like that. Um, so I guess it depends on your goals, but I think sleep is really the main like experiment there. So it's fun. It's a fun experiment. <laughs> I, I think this is kind of the perfect transition into starting to talk about Cocodona because there's so much that we can cover here. And we're going to try to do our best to, to cram in as much as possible into a short period of time while, while we have Maggie. And we'll move into our after show and ask more questions and stuff. But in regards to Cocodona 250, it's the inaugural race. Uh, I don't know of anyone who's really strung this, this line together other than maybe a, a personal project, that sort of thing. But uh, the line itself being 250 miles through the Arizona desert, you're going to deal with all sorts of things from elevation to heat to exposure, not a lot of shade, uh, nutrition, hydration, all these issues. With your training and your background, having tackled these events that don't necessarily have a finished number, like you're, you're, you know, when you do bigs or when you do these backyard ultras, you're not setting out to, to run 100 miles. There is no finish line. The finish line is constantly moving. So how did you have to reprogram your brain to tackle something that does have a finish line, but that finish line is 250 miles away? Uh, how do you sort of tackle that or at least shift the brain mindset in going into it? I, I, I think I'm desensitized because like I know when it was going to start, like you said, I know where the finish line is. I just have to get there and, and not screw up too much in the middle. And so, and everything is new, the hallway, like I really had not been out any part of the course. So I thought it would be super cool. Like not, it never got boring. Um, you never really had to like mentally play games where I'm like, okay, only this much to go or anything like that. It was just like, what's next? Um, but less pep at some point. Cause <laughs> I think tired. But like, um, I don't know. I, I, I thought that I was like a little worried cause I wasn't nervous and I'm like, maybe I should be, it's still really far. And I'm like, I've done 250 miles once, but this is like different. Um, and I was like, well, whatever, you know, there's, there's so many factors that are not unknown that it didn't seem that scary. <laughs> It's interesting. Like I can imagine psychologically, it's interesting because when you when you enter something like a backyard, uh, where the end you don't know, you know maybe what you've done in the past. And talking to you and talking to Andy Pearson and to Courtney and to other people who've done really really well at these backyard ultras on this show and and in passing, you can't enter one of those races with a I hope I get to 100 miles. Right? You can't go into it with that mental finish line because if you do, then after that point. This is, again, I haven't done one of these, but I've only heard from experiences that if you go in saying, I'm going to get to 100 miles, once you get there, there's not much carrot being dangled in front of you to continue on. And it sort of like deteriorates from there. So I can only imagine for for you and, and for others who do so well at those events, there is a certain amount of turning your brain off and just like rather than looking at it as a giant piece you're looking at it as just little stages. Is that how Cocodona felt to you? Like point to point, point to point, foot in front of the next sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, I mean, you, your crew could go to most aid stations, but I had originally, I had this couple, Amy and David, um, I met them through our ambassador team in Tailwind and they live in their van part time, but they're from the Pacific Northwest and they were like, well, we're going to be down doing the rim to rim to rim Saturday. So like we can crew that whole week, which is amazing. Cause like, they don't even really know me. Like what if I was a diva, which we kind of, <laughs> they're, they're like, they're like, Courtney was so impressed with them too. She's like, they're like professional crew people. She's like, maybe I should have them crew for me. And then Kevin can just pace. Cause like I had them just crewing and then I had pacers like, so not everyone's exhausted. They at least got like a couple hours of sleep at a time because they could just move their van to the next location and sleep. So honestly, having them made it like super stress free. Mm. And so I would go, okay, I see them, you know, the big section in the beginning, you didn't see your crew till 37 miles. So that was like over nine hours 
<clears throat> and so like you know that was kind of like oh like the carrot you know just get to them and um I was gonna go 100 miles with no pacer um and then pick up Kyle Curtin um who's a local in Durango and I don't really know him that well either but um he doesn't have like a traditional job nine to five so he came out for the whole week and helped crew and um I ended up being like oh this is taking a lot longer to get to 100 so he jumped in like no problem at 74 and and started pacing and then I had a different pacers each like section like I would take large chunks of two or three legs um so like each one was like a new fresh person it was like fun um and I feel like Kyle was like, you have like the all-star team of Pacers, which I really did. Like it was like Nicole Bitter, Zach Bitter, Kyle Curtin, Courtney DeWalter, Kevin Schmidt, and Brian Tinder, who the role was he had to be clothed while he was pacing me. Cause <laughs> actually funny story is like the live feed at the finish when you're like running down that long road dropped out. And Brian Tinder came running in that Borat thing. So, I mean, thousands of people who were watching would have seen that had that not dropped uh, if you're in a dead zone or something. And uh, so he made an appearance later in that that song. It would have surely got their YouTube channel flagged. And it would have been a huge ordeal like to, to try to convince YouTube. Uh, let me explain what's happening. This is a runner in a 250 mile race. It's a costume. Um, I can I can see how having new faces or new, you know, just new personalities joining up every 25, 40, 50 miles is probably a huge, uh, uh, just fun perk. And referring to that as the carrot is a really cool way of looking at it as, yeah, I get to run with Courtney now, or I get to run with uh, Kyle now, or I get to run with any number of people. That's a really interesting way of looking at 250 miles rather than the whole piece 250 miles it's more like i get to run with friends for 30 40 miles at a time uh again we have lots of live questions let's get to maybe a couple of these and then we'll start diving into specifics from the race uh yeah sure uh question from skylar in the chat room skylar asked how did maggie prefer to be paced just someone there for company someone cracking the whip etc and did that change throughout the course of the event um okay the biggest whip cracker was nicole bitter <laughs> She ran like way ahead and was like, how about you try running? And I was like, I <laughs> she had, we had an uphill section, which wasn't so long up Mingus, but the descent to Jerome was horrible. It was like, I thought I was like, oh, cool. It'll be like eight miles of Jeep road, but it was full of rocks. And like, I was just really exhausted at that point. And I was, so I was trying to do a little jog and I timed it and I was running like 25, 20 to 22. 22 to 25 minute miles and then I was hiking 22 to 25 minute miles so I was like they're the same and she's like no keep going <laughs> like, she's already like been out here way longer than this is supposed to be and um but yeah like I didn't really have like a, a preference we would switch off and on I don't know like I, I was honestly really was just moving forward as fast as I can each time um and and then Courtney had me at the at the very last section, um, so she you know you can't let Courtney down and slack off too much. So she was just like, that was the climb up Eldon where you know she kind of coached me through. She's just like, you don't have to move fast, just keep moving. And I think we did a good job. And um, yeah, they all let me nap when I was really tired and swerving, which was nice. Um, I heard Mike McKnight said uh, or Ben Light when he did the Colorado trail, wouldn't let him sleep at all. And I was like, Oh God, thank God my pacers are like nice and let me nap. <laughs> like that would be really hard. Uh, we actually have run steep, get high in the chat. I don't know who is behind the account right now, whether it's Jamil or another one of the staff members, but a tip of the hat to run steep, get high on incredible live race coverage, really truly setting what's what the standard of what is possible. Uh, for, you know, big endurance events like this, it was just days and days of live coverage. So big shout out to the whole team behind the cameras there. Um, I can only imagine the number of hurdles that you sort of had to overcome in an, in an event like this. Uh, this is what we heard early on. Well, one, referring to a, a race over the course of a week, like it's, it's different. It, you know, it's different to say like, 
the race started on Saturday morning and everyone finished by Sunday night. Even that's extreme. But to say it started on Monday and people were finishing Friday and like basically spending the whole week out in the desert running is it's it's crazy. So there are going to be a number of hurdles that you have to overcome. One of which early on was the time difference, probably in expected arrival times or expected durations for sections and how much slower it was. How quickly were you able to adapt to that or were you, was your crew able to adapt to that or was it an issue for you at all? Um, I mean, I had an idea. So they have like this, so much information and it was really organized with like the crew info and all that. But there were expected first runner times that I knew like there's just no way. And, and especially talking to Jamil and his like having him as like a you know, his personal experience there. Um, and I watched their five episodes of their course preview thing. That was really cool. But I just had a feeling that no one was going to cover that one section that was like 22 miles in four and a half hours. Like, um, and so I did tell my crew, I was like, it could be seven to nine hours before I see you. Mm. Um, and so, you know, but the whole thing was more, more, um, slow than I thought. Um, it, it got a little faster when you got to like um, closer to Sedona. Um, but by then you're so tired and you're like, well, this is what it is. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really think about time, but I was more worried about like people being there a day longer than they like planned to be and things like that. But yeah, I mean, it just kind of blurred together. <laughs> <laughs> that That's also a big part of st stuff like this. Uh, having done 100 miles and knowing how much that blurred together, how much of the 250 miles, the, the, the multiple days, how much of that blurs together? Is it peaks and valleys of little moments that you remember? Or do you actually remember a lot of it? Like, can you comprehend a lot of it? Yeah, I mean, I think I can replay the whole course in, in my head. Like, I was pretty alert and and stuff i know that i got a couple moments where i was like just so tired i couldn't keep my eyes open or move forward really like well but um it 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 was pretty clear it's cool too because y you're just like seeing everything like i said for the first time you've never i've never seen a lot of that right. some of it oh i know it was beautiful but it was in the dark and it still is pretty cool from what you could see in your headlamp and um yeah i mean i Ryan was joking that like, oh, you go to the desert and run forever and don't even remember it. And I'm like, I do. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, it's just really cool. I, it, it does seem like you're like, oh wait, you're trying to figure out what day. To, oh, at one aid station, the Walnut Canyon, you have 20 miles to go, and the EMT guy puts the pulse ox thing to make sure you're okay and asks you a couple questions. He asked what day it was, and uh -huh. I was like. But, and my crew's like, we don't know what day it is. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah. You can't ask someone who's in a multi-day event, like, what day is it? Um, All of them? But also someone, like, just any individual that's made it through 2020, you can't really ask right. them what day it is. I also, um, like, a part of me, you, do days only count when you sleep? Because <laughs> technically, did you sleep? I know that you you took some trail naps, right? Was, it, was that the extent of it? Uh, no, so... Coming to Jerome before sunset on the second night, I just had to lay down and um, Amy suggested that maybe I actually just take like a nap. So I did 20 minutes and she poked her head in and I was like, I think I could keep sleeping. She's like, sleep 10 more minutes. And I was like, oh, okay. Like their van, they're, it's so comfortable. And they, it was such a beauty, like they're it's like even the view from the front of their van overlooked like, this city of Jerome is so pretty, like our town or whatever. It's in this hillside. Um, and it was just like a cool view and it was just peaceful. Mm -hmm. And so I slept for 30 minutes and that whole night I felt really great. I think I had to eventually lie down for like a two minute nap, but that helped recharge me. Um, and so that was awesome. Uh, and then the rest of the 20 minute naps were kind of, I had two more uh, that were unplanned. One was at an aid station um, and then one was just in the side of the trail for 20 minutes. Um, and so I estimated, like, I think I slept for 90 minutes trail nap, the other shorter ones included. Yeah. yeah. 
I like That's this impressive. comment from Nicole in the yeah. chat room. Nicole says, you should have turned that question on its head and asked the medic what day he thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter what he said, just tell him that it was, it was wrong. That it was wrong. Yeah. Uh, it's Thursday. Yeah, no. Uh -huh. no, it's not. Um, now, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm super curious just in regards to what do you think was the most, what, what was the biggest hurdle? What, uh, what was the biggest challenge for you? possibly unexpected challenge throughout the course of, of this event that you had to overcome? The heat. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect it to be hot every single day. I mean, even when I got the Flagstaff, like that day, it felt so hot. It probably wasn't even that hot. I kept asking, I feel like I kept asking my pacers, do you feel really hot? They're like, it's not that hot, but I'm, I think it's okay. <laughs> um, like I was prepared for the first day because they warned it was going to be really hot and exposed. So I did the cotton shirt thing um, with the bandana. Like I did like the whole Western States, like whatever right. thing that you do. I'm surprised like more people didn't, but, um, and then as the heat continued, it's just like, there isn't shade. You're right. There's like barely any. Um, I think, Finally, when I got up on that plateau, it was the third night, the Coconino Plateau. You climb up Kasner, and I think Kevin was pacing me then, and the sun was setting, and you're finally getting into these big ponderosa pines, but then it's cold, yeah. <laughs> and it's night. Um, and that was definitely probably what slowed most people down, I would say. From what we've been hearing from people that were there, the heat was the big slowdown factor. Uh, yeah, it was hot, but it was like relentlessly hot, you know, there was very little escape. So you're talking, uh, just kind of digging into some of the specifics here. I know we could get into the weeds on this stuff, just in regards to heat uh, techniques. So handling the heat, you're talking about a cotton shirt, keeping it constantly wet. Did you, did your team ice? Did you have a giant cool chest, like bad water where you were laying in the cool chest? Like how, how did you beat the heat? Um, I'm too much of a wimp to lay in ice, uh, <laughs> but yeah, we, I had an ice bandana, um, uh, it's the ones Howard Nipper sewed where they're like just the bandana pulled it over with the, and I kept a, so the first aid station at mile like 10 or 11 or whatever, I grabbed ice and put it in there. And even though it wasn't hot yet, and then I just let that drip on my shirt the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so I still got to the crown king and my shirt was damp. So I think that helped. I actually didn't feel super hot on that big climb. Um, I just ran out of water. Uh, well, I brought all tailwind. I brought three liters of tailwind, and I ran out for about two and a half hours before I got to the aid station. I had, like, nothing. Wow. Um, so I think that's what was the biggest challenge. And I think a lot of sections I ran out of liquid. So I would be like, oh, it'll be, I'll get here in four hours, and it would be six, and you'd bring two liters, and that's just not enough. And <clears throat> that was, like, another mistake I kept making. Um, and... Yeah, but the ice bandana, I just kept every day. Like, that was just the, I thought I would ditch it after the first day, but I didn't. It's amazing that something so simple <clears throat> could be so helpful. You know, we saw a lot of people end up having to having to call their days, call call it quits because of the heat and, and just yeah. the impact that it took on them. Yeah. Uh, so many live questions. Kimmy pulled a bunch aside. Let's let's start digging into those. Yeah, just a funny comment from Heather in the chat room. Heather says, I won a 250 mile race, but I'm a wimp because I can't do a nice bath. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh question from Deb in the chat room. Deb says, Maggie, since it was the inaugural year for Cocodona, what suggestions do you have for the race in future years? Course changes, aid stations, time of year. Any any suggestions? Yeah, they sent out a survey after to ask about it, but they've already come up with like a, some major changes. I think for that that main part, that twenty two mile section where everyone ran out of water, they're going to add like a water stop somehow. I mean, you could use donkeys or something, but it's pretty rugged and it's a loose, steep climb full of rocks. Um, but I mean, everything else is great. I think you just now that runners know what to expect like all the information will be out there and like they, they can be like all right well never am i going to just take all the liter of water with me ever on any section and um things like that like i've heard the time you know thrown around to 
to change. But like, if you have it earlier, then you could deal with snow and Flagstaff and like, who right. wants to pull places <laughs> or like, it could be freezing or I don't know. Um, you, yeah, honestly, that course seems like it would suck if it rained because I saw on the one video, they have that, just like we have in Durango, that clay mud that sticks to your shoes. And I will take a hundred degree heat over clay mud any day because that just sucks your soul. Like your shoes weigh like seven pounds. It's just not fun. <laughs> yeah, so, it seems like the time actually, despite being hot, that's kind of the factor you're dealing with is, is heat yeah. versus, I mean, you brought up snow. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, some of that trail would be super treacherous if it was, you know, you still had six, seven feet of snow on it, um, let alone mud, that'd be crazy. I think it'll just be like, you know, Western States is in June. People deal with the heat. You just they get prepared. I think it's hard for a lot of people to deal with the heat because it's so early. And so like someone like me is still cold in Durango. Right. Uh, sauna is open. I don't do a lot of heat training. I have in the past for States and I think it helps. Um, but I've never like run with a puffy coat or anything. Um, but like that people from Phoenix did great. Like, you know, cause it's already a hundred degrees there in February. So um, I think it just, it depends on where you're from too. Like it, the heat is really hard to deal with when it's the first time. Like if that was July, that wouldn't be terrible for me. Cause I'd been used to it for a couple of months, but it's just early. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also super curious in regards to, uh, the number of people on course, were you able to form like camaraderie with other runners or was it really spaced out? Was it really lonely and remote in certain sections? Did you even notice at any point, uh, was your brain so focused on just staying upright and leaning forward and getting it done? Uh, did you notice the distance between runners at all? Yeah, it got real spaced out in the very beginning. I got to run with Mike McKnight for a little bit while he died a slow heat death and I was really worried about him on that one section. And, um, and then, uh, I ran a good amount of miles with Andy Pearson for, uh, after crown King and I would have been able to run with him more, but, um, I had chugged so much water. My electrolytes were off and I started dry heaving and, um, so nice. He wanted to make sure I was okay. I was like, I will live. You need to go. Uh, but we caught back up at the aid station at camp Kippo, which is like, at 7,400 feet and it was nighttime and I'm still wearing this wet cotton shirt because I didn't think I was going to be out that long and I would see my crew. Um, and he saved my butt and gave me a long sleeve shirt because I was like freezing. Um, and so that was the last I saw Andy. And then I did get to run like 19 miles with the runner Trevor Metting from Texas. I think he finished like one behind me. Um, and he ran with me and Zach Bitter on the second night for like 20 miles. Um, and that's the most I ever ran with any one runner. Otherwise I didn't wow. see anyone. I probably with Pete Mortimer a bunch until I didn't see him anymore. Um, but yeah, there was like, you know, it's funny too, because you have the live tracking in a lot of places right. on the court. So it's like my pacers would set track to say who's behind me and how far and how far up in front, um, <clears throat> which I don't know if is a good or bad thing, but I feel like at the end, you know, there are five miles ahead of me and five miles behind me. And you're kind of like, well, this is, this is it. But like, you know, if you didn't know, would you run harder? Maybe like, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. That's an oh, interesting yeah. also dynamic. Uh, there was a point where, I mean, we were watching the live stream and it was kind of a, it was a cool moment. I don't know if Jamil's still watching, maybe just in passing, but, um, there was a cool moment watching the live stream where they cut to an aid station. I forget the name of the aid station. And there was a fire it was at night and everyone, all the runners were kind of sitting by the fire and getting warm. And Jamil was one of them. And it was kind of this interesting moment where he, as the race director is also in the middle of running the race. And he's talking with the live camera at this remote aid station with the home base. And he was talking about how he was watching the live stream throughout the day, also watching the live tracking throughout the day while he was running. <laughs> and that was sort of a weird moment of like, these runners are moving so like the distance is so <clears throat> far and the speed, I can only imagine the heat slowing you down the distance you're, you're, you're not trying to kick out six minute miles. You have time to pull up a live tracker and see where people are and live video feed to watch the race unfold. Did you, did you do that at all? Was that a weird surreal sort of thing to be doing while you're in the midst of the race? 
I, I didn't look at the live feed at all. It's funny because, like, I was talking to Jamil before, and I was like, we should run the first 50K together. Like, it'll be fun. <clears throat> and I saw him at the start line with the camera, one giant camera with the live feed going and then a GoPro. And I was like, okay, I don't, uh, I think we got like different things going on here. And I had to see if he was anywhere near me and, and he wasn't, so I ran my own pace and never saw him again. But, um, it was a lot. <laughs> well, I mean, live feed, but yeah, we did check the leader thing just to see like where runners were and, and things like that. Yeah, the live the live stuff was a whole other beast. So, you know, when we, when we did Tiger Claw uh, in 2019, I wanted to do a live camera feed, and I ended up backing it at the last minute because my brain couldn't process having to do all of those things simultaneously. So I can only imagine what Jamil was dealing with on the day, and probably having cameras follow him and stuff. So from your perspective, it was probably I'm gonna go do my own race. I'll let I'll let you guys take care of all the all the camera and the <laughs> behind the scenes. Did you have cameras in your face throughout the race? Like, how did that feel? It's 250 miles, so I imagine there was not cameras in your face the whole time. But having the live feed and stuff, what was that like from a runner's perspective? How often did it uh, impact? Like, did you see people regularly? Or, or what was that experience like on your end? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't really notice too much like I think mostly when you would come into an aid station or near one or they would and they were like super respectful they'd be like can we follow you out or can we um like oh like at one point Tony was like hey can you talk to the camera now is after a turkey butte and when I took a nap and I could barely get my legs moving and I just felt awful and I was like no not right now and he's like that's fine uh, that was the only time like it was just not a good time um but like, I didn't really notice mostly because you're just kind of racing or they'd ask you a question. I think there was, like, at Sedona, there was, like, the whole foot routine was uh, being live feed. And I was, like, and then I'm trying to think about what time it is. And they're, like, oh, a thousand people are watching. And I'm, like, oh, people are eating, like, breakfast now. Like, what is going on? Why? And then, yeah, oh, the only time I was, like, so I, after Crown King, I forget the aid station, but you're trying to you, – you're on dirt road for a long time. You finally – get on single track and I was just running I got over the fence and and ran single track and I freaked out because there was someone behind me and it was a camera guy and I turned around I was like holy shit I was like you scared me and he's like oh yeah I'm just gonna follow you for a little bit and I was like oh I was <laughs> my own world and didn't think like you know whatever um so he just followed me for a little bit and then and then that was it but um yeah the only time I was like aware of them was like at the very end mm. when they're you know on Eldon and following you up Eldon and the whole end um and just because I at that point I had a really bad cough um like from day one I was just hacking up this like gross stuff from I guess from all the dust and I wonder if running out of fluids so many times too didn't help the whole situation mm. talked to a lot of different runners you had coughs after and stuff and I completely lost my voice for like four days so the whole respiratory thing. but um all I wanted to do is cough and and blow snot rockets that were bloody messes I knew cameras were watching so I couldn't <laughs> I'm sorry our, our dog literally just started snoring really loud behind me I'm just like I need this I need the quiet this snoring uh I can't, yeah, I can't, there's a part of me that's like, I'm so excited when I'm watching these live streams and I'm seeing you come down that finish line and from Eldon and everything like that. That's really exciting from a viewer's perspective. Uh, but I can also imagine there's an element of, of you being at the front, just wanting to get it done after 250 miles. After, Blow your snot rockets. Like you want to do it. <laughs> Did your brain, I mean, oh God, at that point, does your brain even process I'm live? There's a thousand, 500 people watching me blow snot rockets. Do I care? Like, did that even cross your mind? Um, well, it's funny because I was like, oh, if I keep coughing, I feel like my mom's watching and she's going to be concerned. <laughs> so I said, I find it. Amy's like, your mom is very concerned about your cough. And I was like, I know it. You knew. I was like, I knew. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't realize like, not how many people are watching, but you can kind of hear the chatter from his camera um, and stuff they were saying and, and things like that. But the coolest moment was like, well, I was also thinking like, is this exciting to people? Cause it's just running down the hill for so long. And I thought it would be like 
quicker, but I'm like, this is going on forever. Well, we get to Buffalo Park and, you know, it's like this place, a really great place in Flagstaff that has this two mile loop where you run right through the center. And there's like this mix of people who are just out for a walk, have no idea what's going on. There's drones flying overhead. There's like yeah. multiple people, cameras following me. And like, um, they were just probably like, what is this? And then other people knew what was going on and they're cheering and clapping. And I felt like it was like a movie or something. <laughs> And I saw like Caleb from Pizza Cletta like leaning on there with his like motorcycle. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> like it was like super cool. And then, you know, you're running and you're running through the streets and you stop at then you stop at traffic lights and you wait for the traffic. <laughs> and then you start running again and then like the traffic light. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Like we're turning the corner um and I hear cowbells and I was running with Courtney at that point, and I was like, is this what UTMB is like? And she just laughed because, like, <laughs> like tens of thousands of people at UTMB. Oh. But it's a like, smaller scale, and I think it's super cool what they're doing. Like, I mean, my brain would never be like, what you said, where you're like, how am I going to do all this? Like, who's messed up brain? Well, we know it's Jamil's, but, like, we could be, fathom that they can make, like, live stream a race, like, 100K and make it exciting, and let alone a 250 miler. Like, I mean, it's insane. Like, and and it sounded like people really got into it. Like, my whole family was watching it. Like, I had cousins, and they don't follow ultra running, so it must have been like, somewhat exciting to watch. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, Angela it, in the chat room's like, it's it was super exciting to watch. Like, we were glued to it. I mean, it's something that the sport has been pining after for so long you know so many of these races just don't have the utmb budget they just don't have a million dollars or a tv station in in their backyard yeah. that can do this sort of stuff so when when technology finally caught up in the last year technology finally has sort of allowed this potential to happen really breaking boundaries here doing what what uh what they did it allowed us to be in that driver's seat with you which is something that no one gets to witness unless they are at the race uh, and let alone run along with you. No one yeah. gets to do that. Like getting to run with Maggie Gutero at, for the last five miles of a 250 mile race is is special. Uh, it doesn't matter if it takes an hour or two hours or whatever. We're sitting there glued. It, it, it was a wonderful moment and uh, for ultra running. A so lot of folks in the chat room talking about the traffic lights. Oh, the traffic lights were, <laughs> I mean, everyone felt those lights with you. <laughs> I'm sure for you, it felt like eight days. Just come on, turn green. For us, it's like, oh, man, traffic lights. We know the feeling that she's feeling. You're like, we're sitting in our living rooms on our comfy couches relating to Maggie Gutero uh, in the last five miles. Let's get to some live questions because uh, we're kind of approaching the mm -hmm. end of our main show here. And then we'll move into our after show yeah. with Maggie and start getting into uh, more specifics and stuff. But Kim, take it away. Ask as many as we want here. Yeah, since we're kind of approaching the end of the show and the end of the race recap as well. And we're talking about the live stream. There's a great question from Kristen from the Discord server saying, uh, Maggie, what did you and the little girl chat about after you finished? Was a very cool moment to catch right before the live feed cut out. Very symbolic how widely and deeply you inspire and influence and influence so many of us yeah um i was trying to figure out whose little girl that was because she said her mom was running and i still haven't figured it out um but she said like congratulations and i honestly like afterwards my eyes were going cross-eyed and i was talking to different people and like i don't remember exactly what she said like she was saying congratulations and she was like looked really shy and her dad was just standing over there being like yeah it's okay and like yeah, she she said like it's it's amazing or something. I don't know. Um, and you know, she said her mom was out there, and I asked her if her she's gonna pace her mom, and she said no. And um, yeah, I never figured out whose kid it was, but she was super sweet, and it was really cute. And like this girl's gonna grow up. Like her mom is an ultra runner doing this, so she's gonna like see that and have that as an example. And maybe this will be normal to her growing up and she'll yeah. do it. Um, and another really cool qu uh, comment in the chat room from Christy. Christy says, I showed my six-year-old niece the footage of Maggie during Cocodona. Her eyes got wide, jaw dropped, and then she said, I can do that. Not can I do that, but I can do that. So it's very, very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, they could all be like the 20th anniversary of Cocodona running or something like that. 
That's when it becomes a 500 mile race. Pocodona 500. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you. <laughs> I'm only doing the 250. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. When ultra running gets to the point when you are when you say, I am only doing the 250. Yeah. All right. Uh, you want to do one or two more? Think, um... We good? We'll, we'll say before the episode. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to wrap up our main show here with Maggie Guterrell and talking about the Cocodona 250. Just to kind of put it all into perspective, uh, it took Maggie three days, 13 hours, and 34 minutes to get the 250-mile race done, um, which is bonkers. That's only about 13 hours uh, uh, beyond three days. It's it's massive undertaking, 85 hours. Thank you, math in my head, for doing it so quickly. <laughs> I was like, where are you oh going God. with this? I was trying to get the actual hours, like 85 hours, uh, 85 hours and uh, 34 minutes. Um, it is an unbelievable accomplishment to not only run the 250 miles, but to also crush it in first place. Did you feel the chase? Did you at any moment, did you feel that anticipation of uh, that you were going to win it? Or at any point, did you feel because uh, with a 250 mile race, I imagine it's a bit different than something like marathon a 50k even a 100 miler which can sometimes come down to the finish at any point did you feel like you had it locked uh and did you feel that impetus to really race it um yeah i mean there was a bunch of women that were like either just behind me or i think got past when i took a nap and um like you never felt like you could just um you know because the, the margin of error is so big um you never know that you really just have it. Um, I think finally just going up Eldon or leaving Walnut Canyon with 20 miles to go, you're like, all right, like as long as anything doesn't go terribly wrong, like you're seventh place overall and, and you got it, but not really like you just never know. <laughs> we are just blown away. Uh, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment, Maggie, and you are truly an inspiration and uh, an icon for so many. I think, you're really paving the way for a lot of young runners to come in and, and yeah. really take the sport by by storm. So we appreciate everything you do. And uh, I more questions, of course, in regards to nutrition and how you handle all that stuff. We'll handle that in the after show. We'll ask some of those specifics. Uh, but Maggie, for those who maybe are interested in following you on social media or learning more about stuff that you have upcoming or future projects, where can they find you on social media? How can they follow you? Uh, let's give you your plug. Um, I am on Instagram at Magatron runs, um, also on Twitter, but I'm never on there. So really just Instagram when there's lots of pictures of Titus cause he doesn't have his own Instagram. Um, yeah. And that's it. Fantastic. Go give Maggie a follow. It is awesome to have her on the show tonight and to talk a little bit about Coconut 250, her big win at the 250 mile distance just God, two weeks ago. Oh yeah. Maggie, how are you feeling? <laughs> how, how are you recovering? Are you feeling okay? Are you back to normalcy, do you think? Uh, somewhat. That was a rough week. I was really tired. Like, I was never sore. I could have gone for, for a run if I had energy. I just I just didn't. I slept a lot, and then I had to work on last week, and and uh, I might have taken some naps during work, but that's okay. I got <laughs> I imagine that they are probably very forgiving. Uh, Tailwind is is uh, where Maggie works. I'm sure they're like, we get it. That's what we do to get a whole week off. I'm like, all right. miles in the day. That's it. That's all you got to do to get some time off at work, or at least a nap time, maybe a nap hour. Um, a big thank you to our guest, Maggie Guterrell, for joining us tonight. Again, follow her on social media. Uh, we like to wrap our Ginger Runner Live episodes with a little segment that we're calling the GR Crew Member of the Week, where we get to recognize a member of the community who goes above and beyond and does something pretty damn amazing, much like Maggie herself. Mm -hmm. So, Kim, who is this week's GR Crew Member? Uh, this week's GR Crew Member of the Week is Jessica Schult. And Jessica, so Jessica wrote in on Discord and says, well, Jessica has covered 50K before the distance. She's never went after it at a race effort level. So Jessica set a goal of running fast and climbing 5,500 feet with a dream goal of sub 630 and a secondary goal of sub seven. And I'm happy to report uh, Jessica ran her first race effort ultra sub seven hours. So congratulations, Wonderful. Jessica. 
Congratulations, Jessica. Awesome to have you as our GR crew member of the week. Longtime supporter. We really appreciate you. And uh, that is going to be it for today's episode, episode 353 with Maggie Gutero. Uh, we are going to move right into our after show. You can join our after shows. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. All of our guests will join us usually in our after shows. You can watch all the archived after shows. We also do our daily live stream called Daily Brew. Uh, again, all sorts of fun stuff happening on the GR Crew site. So head on over. Oh, there goes the website. But head on over there. Join us. We'd love to see you. Uh, that is it for tonight's episode. Awesome. Awesome accomplishment by our guest. And we're going to go right into the after show with Maggie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, I hope all. you have a great rest of your week. Get out there, train hard, race harder, and party the hardest. I know I am. See you guys next week. Goodbye. Bye. Ginger Ronner.